Hey, thanks for coming back. Uh, this is episode two. We're going to pick up where we left off yesterday. Harry Frankfurt, the fellow who wrote this book, was discussing uh, the comparison between humbug, the notion of humbug from a guy named Max Black, who wrote a book called The Prevalence of Humbug, with the concept of bullshit. So we're just going to pick up where we left off there. And here he quotes uh, one of Max Black's concepts on what humbug is. Misrepresentation of somebody's own thoughts, feelings, or attitudes. This provision that the perpetrator of humbug is essentially misrepresenting himself raises some very central issues. To begin with, whenever a person deliberately misrepresents anything, he must inevitably be misrepresenting his own state of mind. It's possible, of course, for a person to misrepresent that alone, for instance, by pretending to have a desire or a feeling which he does not actually have. I have a vague memory of that from 20-odd years ago when I used to be dating. But suppose that a person, whether by telling a lie or in another way, misrepresents something else then he necessarily misrepresents at least two things. He misrepresents whatever he's talking about, that is, the state of affairs, that's the topic or the referent of his discourse. And in doing this, he cannot avoid misrepresenting his own mind as well. Thus, someone who lies about how much money he has in his pocket both gives an account of the amount of money in his pocket and conveys that he believes this account. Those are two lies. If the lie works, its victim is twice deceived, having one false belief about what is in the liar's pocket and another false belief about what's in the liar's mind. Now, it's unlikely that Black wishes the referent of humbug to be in every instance the state of the speaker's mind. There's no particular reason, after all, why humbug may not be about other things. Black probably means that humbug is not designed primarily to give its audience a false belief about whatever state of affairs may be the topic, but that its primary intention is rather to give its audience a false impression concerning what's going on in the speaker's mind. Insofar as it is humbug, the creation of this impression is its main purpose and point. Understanding Black along these lines suggests a hypothesis to account for his characterization of humbug as short of lying. If I lie to you about how much money I have, then I do not thereby make an explicit assertion concerning my beliefs. Therefore, one might, with some plausibility, maintain that, although in telling the lie, I certainly misrepresent what's in my mind, this misrepresentation as distinct from my misrepresentation of what is in my pocket, is not, strictly speaking, a lie at all. For I do not come right out with any statement whatever about what is in my mind, nor does the statement, I do affirm, for example, I have $20 in my pocket, imply any statement that attributes a belief to me. I'm going to pause here. I follow him on this point. I'm not sure if I agree with him, and it may be a strictly logical point. That is, you know, strictly logically, my saying I have $20 in my pocket, I'm not saying that I believe it, I'm just asserting it to you. But I think in the common usage, when someone says that, then we also believe that you believe it as well. I think we make that assumption, but, you know, he's smarter than I am, so take his word for it, not mine. On the other hand, It is unquestionable that in so affirming, I provide you with a reasonable basis for making certain judgments about what I believe. In particular, I provide you with a reasonable basis for supposing that I believe I have $20 in my pocket. Since this supposition is by hypothesis false, I do in telling the lie tend to deceive you concerning what is in my mind, even though I do not actually tell a lie about that. In this light, it does not seem unnatural or inappropriate to regard me as misrepresenting my own beliefs in a way that is short of lying. 
It's easy to think of familiar situations by which Black's account of humbug appears to be unproblematically confirmed. Consider a Fourth of July orator who goes on bombastically about our great and blessed country whose founding fathers, under divine guidance, created a new beginning for mankind. This is surely humbug. As Black's account suggests, the orator is not lying. He would be lying only if it were his intention to bring about in his audience beliefs that he himself regards as false. Concerning such matters as whether our country is great, whether it is blessed, whether the founders had divine guidance, and whether what they did was in fact to create a new beginning for mankind. But the orator does not really care what his audience thinks about the Founding Fathers or about the role of the deity in our country's history or the like. At least, it is not an interest in what anyone thinks about these matters that motivates the speech. It's clear that what makes Fourth of July oration humbug is not fundamentally that the speaker regards his statements as false. Rather, just as Black's account suggests, the orator intends these statements to convey a certain impression of himself. He's not trying to deceive anyone concerning American history. What he cares about is what people think of him. He wants them to think of him as a patriot, as someone who has deep thoughts and feelings about the origins and the mission of our country, who appreciates the importance of religion, who's sensitive to the greatness of our history, whose pride in that history is combined with humility before God and so on. Black's account of humbug appears, then, to fit certain paradigms snugly. Nonetheless, I do not believe that it adequately or accurately grasps the essential character of bullshit. It is correct to say of bullshit, as he says of humbug, both that it is short of lying and that those who perpetrate it misrepresent themselves in a certain way. But Black's account of these two features is significantly off the mark. I shall next attempt to develop by considering some biographical material pertaining to Ludwig Wittgenstein, a preliminary but more accurately focused appreciation of just what the central characteristics of bullshit are. And we're on page 19 now, and we're just about to step foot into the heart of his argument. And Amazingly, he brings in Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who's this brilliant uh, linguistics philosopher or philosopher of linguistics. I, I tried to read The Son of a Bitch when I was in school and could barely make it through anything. But he's a very important person in the history of thought and in the intellectual history of the 20th century. And he's completely understandable in what Frankfurt talks about here. So we're going to proceed. And now we're getting to the nub of the matter. Wittgenstein once said that the following bit of verse by Longfellow could serve him as a motto. In the elder days of art, builders wrought with greatest care, each minute and unseen part, for the gods are everywhere. The point of these lines is clear. In the old days, craftsmen did not cut corners. They worked carefully, and they took care with every aspect of their work, every part of the product, was considered, and each was designed and made to be exactly as it should be. These craftsmen did not relax their thoughtful self-discipline, even with respect to features of their work that would ordinarily not be visible. If any of you are fans of the Antiques Roadshow, you'll see this. They'll pull out the drawers, or they'll turn old furniture upside down to show the craftsmanship. These are elements of the furniture that were never meant to be seen, but they took as much and often more care to um, make as the parts that were clearly visible. Although no one would notice if those features were not quite right, the craftsmen would be bothered by their consciences. So nothing was swept under the rug, or one might perhaps also say, there was no bullshit. It does seem fitting to construe carelessly made, shoddy goods as in some way analogs of bullshit. But in what way? Is the resemblance that bullshit itself is invariably produced in a careless or self-indulgent manner, that it's never finely crafted, 
that in making that in the making of it there is never the meticulously attentive concern with detail to which Longfellow alludes. Is the bullshitter by his very nature a mindless slob? Is his product necessarily messy or unrefined? The word shit does, to be sure, suggest this. Excrement is not designed or crafted at all. Speak for yourself. It is merely emitted or dumped. It may have a more or less coherent shape, or it may not, but it is in any case certainly not wrought. Sort of hard to argue with that. The notion of carefully wrought bullshit involves, then, a certain inner strain. Thoughtful attention to detail requires discipline and objectivity. It entails accepting standards and limitations that forbid the indulgence of impulse or whim. It is this selflessness that, in connection with bullshit, strikes us as in opposite. But in fact, it is not out of the question at all. The realms of advertising and of public relations and the nowadays closely related realm of politics are replete with instances of bullshit so unmitigated that they can serve among the most indisputable and classic paradigms of the concept. And in these realms, there are exquisitely sophisticated craftsmen who, with the help of advanced and demanding techniques of market research, of public opinion polling, of psychological testing, and so forth, dedicate themselves tirelessly to getting every word and image they produce exactly right. Yet there is something more to be said about this. However studiously and conscientiously the bullshitter proceeds, it remains true that he is also trying to get away with something. There is surely in his work, as in the work of the slovenly craftsman, some kind of laxity that resists or eludes the demands of a disinterested and austere discipline. The pertinent mode of laxity cannot be equated evidently with simple carelessness or inattention to detail. I shall attempt in due course to locate it more correctly. Wittgenstein devoted his philosophical energies largely to identifying and combating what he regarded as insidiously disruptive forms of nonsense. He was apparently like that in his personal life as well. This comes out in an anecdote related by Fania Pascal, who knew him in Cambridge in the 1930s. And then he quotes from Fania Pascal. I had my tonsils out and was in the Evelyn nursing home feeling sorry for myself. Wittgenstein called. I croaked. I feel just like a dog that's been run over. He was disgusted. You don't know what a dog that's been run over feels like. I don't know why I made Wittgenstein just sound like an old Jew. He was not. Well, I guess he was, but. Is Austrian. Now, who knows what really happened? It seems extraordinary, almost unbelievable, that anyone could object seriously to what Pascal reports herself as having said. That characterization of her feelings, so innocently close to the utterly commonplace sick as a dog, is simply not provocative enough to arouse any response as lively or intense as disgust. If Pascal's simile is offensive, then what figurative or elusive uses of language would not be? So perhaps it did not really happen quite as Pascal says. Perhaps Wittgenstein was trying to make a small joke and it misfired. He was only pretending to ball Pascal out just for the fun of a little hyperbole. And she got the tone and the intention wrong. She thought he was disgusted by her remark when in fact He was only trying to cheer her up with some playfully exaggerated mock criticism or joshing. It's hard to imagine Wittgenstein joshing, but I guess we can. In that case, the incident is not incredible or bizarre at all. But if Pascal failed to recognize that Wittgenstein was only teasing, that he was serious, was at least not so far out of the question, she knew him. 
She knew what to expect from him. She knew how he made her feel. Her way of understanding, or of misunderstanding his remark, was very likely not altogether discordant. Um, was not altogether discordant then with her sense of what he was like. We may fairly suppose that even if her account of the incident is not strictly true to the facts of, Wit of Wittgenstein's intention, it is sufficiently true to her idea of Wittgenstein to have made sense to her. For the purposes of this discussion, that's his premise, I shall accept Pascal's report at face value, supposing that when it came to the use of elusive or figurative language, Wittgenstein was indeed as preposterous as she makes him out to be. Then just what is it that the Wittgenstein in her report considers to be objectionable? Let us assume that he is correct about the facts. That is, Pascal really does not know how run-over dogs feel. Even so, when she says what, she's do what she does, plainly she's not lying. She would have been lying if, when she made her statement, she was aware that she actually felt quite good. For however little she knows about the lives of dogs, it must certainly be clear to Pascal that when dogs are run over, they do not feel good. So if she herself had in fact been feeling good, it would have been a lie to assert that she felt like a run over dog. Pascal Wittgenstein intends to accuse her not of lying, but of misrepresentation of another sort. She characterizes her feeling as the feeling of a run-over dog. She's not really acquainted, however, with the feeling to which this phrase refers. Of course, the phrase is far from being complete nonsense to her. She's hardly speaking gibberish. What she says has an intelligible connotation, which she certainly understands. Moreover, she does know something about the quality of the feeling to which the phrase refers. She knows at least that it's an undesirable and unenjoyable, a bad feeling. The trouble with her statement is that it purports to convey something more than simply that she feels bad. Her characterization of her feeling is too specific. It is excessively particular. Hers is not just any bad feeling, but, according to her account, the distinctive kind of bad feeling that a dog has when it's run over. To the Wittgenstein and Pascal story, judging from his response, this is just bullshit. Now, assuming that Wittgenstein does indeed regard Pascal's characterization of how she feels as an instance of bullshit, why does it strike him that way? It does so, I believe, because he perceives what Pascal says as being, roughly speaking for now, unconnected to a concern with the truth. I'm going to stop here, take a pause. I've already read this book several times. If you take nothing else from this book, that's the phrase you should take. Unconnected to a concern with the truth. And most of what we read from here on is going to be about discussing how bullshit's primary quality is this lack of concern with a connectedness to truth. Back to the book. Her statement is not germane to the enterprise of describing reality. She does not even think she knows, except in the vaguest way how a run-over dog feels. Her description of her own feeling is, accordingly, something that she's merely making up. She concocts it out of whole cloth, or, if she got it from someone else, she is repeating it quite mindlessly and without any regard for how things really are. It is for this mindlessness that Pascal's Wittgenstein chides her. What disgusts him is that Pascal is not even concerned whether her statement is correct. There is every likelihood, of course, that she says what she does only in a somewhat clumsy effort to speak colorfully or to appear vivacious or good-humored. And no doubt Wittgenstein's reaction, as she construes it, is absurdly intolerant. Be this as it may, it seems clear what that reaction is. He reacts as though he perceives her to be speaking about her feeling thoughtlessly, without conscientious attention to the relevant facts. Her statement is not wrought with the greatest care. 
That's the phrase from Longfellow from earlier. She makes it without bothering to take into account at all the question of its accuracy. The point that troubled Wittgen, Wittgenstein is manifestly not that Pascal has made a mistake in her description of how she feels, nor is it even that she's made a careless mistake. Her laxity or her lack of care is not a matter of having permitted an error to slip into her speech on account of some inadvertent or momentary negligent lapse in the attention she was devoting to getting things right. The point is rather that. So far as Wittgenstein can see, Pascal offers a description of a certain state of affairs without genuinely submitting to the constraints which the endeavor to provide an accurate representation of reality imposes. Her fault is not that she failed to get things right, but that she's not even trying. This is important to Wittgenstein. Because whether justifiably or not, he takes what she says seriously as a statement purporting to give an informative description of the way that she feels. He construes her as engaged in an activity to which the distinction between what is true and what is false is crucial. And yet, as taking no interest in whether what she says is true or false, it's in this sense that Pascal's statement is unconnected to a concern with truth. She is not concerned with the truth value of what she says. That is why she cannot be regarded as lying, for she does not presume that she knows the truth, and therefore she cannot be deliberately promulgating, promulgating a proposition that she presumes to be false. Her statement is grounded neither in a belief that is true, nor, as a lie must be, in a belief that it's not true. It is just this lack of connection to a concern with truth, this indifference to how things really are, that I regard as the essence of bullshit. Thank you, and we'll do another section tomorrow.